Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is a well-known composer at Valve who has worked on franchises such as Half-Life, Portal, Team Fortress, and a whole lot more. He has a broad skill set. He is a programmer. He is a visual effects artist, an animator. You name it, he can probably do it. Mike Moreski, how you doing? Hey, nice to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for taking time out of your day to, to do this. Um, first thing I wanted to ask is when it comes to composing, right? Because most composers, they usually stay in that sphere, like the audio sphere or the sound design, the engineering. But obviously you have a broad skill set. Is, have you been able to transfer a lot of skills from those areas into music somehow? Like um, from visual effects or even programming? Is I there think, anything I mean, that you can take from it? That's actually a really interesting good question because I'm like total process nut. Like I'm really interested in the process of creativity, whether it be something woo woo, like, you know, I need to sit in front of the sunset, you know, like for an hour before I can, you know, come up with whatever or um, you know, for that matter, recording music is often almost like acting, you know, mm. like you have to really be in the mood to get to really capture some sorts of feels or be like a consummate professional and be able to really understand the fine nuances of performing something in a, in a particular mood. Um, but when it comes to like actual the process of creating things on a like a production, you know, kind of like in the trenches, um, soldiering basically for you know, getting getting a production done. There is just tons of sort of cross concepts there in terms of like prioritizing your time and choosing which things to um, really invest like uh, like creative space in. You know, if you're going to really push the boundaries in some creative way, there's there's you know ways to sort of uh, optimize that so that you get the biggest bang for your buck and you get the least risk for what you're doing um and so i think that is probably the stuff that is the most this you know most similar across the different domains and um and then communication you know that's obviously a really big one um but composing music is really uh you know music and audio in general are just such unique art forms um mm. Um, music in particular, it's kind of the most abstract um, and famously so, right? Like you can kind of go, oh, yeah, that, you know, piece of orchestral work sounds like a, you know, a storm at sea or whatever. But if no one told you in advance, like, would you actually go, oh, yeah, that that was a I just listened to a storm at sea. Probably not. You know what I mean? Um, and so because of that abstract nature of it, it's it's it it's hard to talk about with, you know, uh, civilians, right? Like people who <laughs> are yeah. other composers um, or have some form of, of musical education or having spent, you know, everyone listens to music. Therefore, everyone's kind of an expert at music, except for when you start to talk about actually creating it and, um, and discussing ways to make it function, you know, uh, more applicably to whatever the project is does that make well, sense yeah but there's like a science to it right like even if you talk about something like eq right and frequencies and when you start doing different layers of different tracks like there'll be certain instruments that might clash with the same instruments in the same frequency range for example so you That's have to right. be aware yeah. of stuff like that so um some composers in, they think about that in in after they've already started composing but are you thinking for, about that from the get-go like oh, i cannot use this instrument because this might clash with another instrument that i want to use or do you kind of figure it out further along in the pipeline i think it's probably a bit of both for yeah. sure you know i the from the very beginning on any project i'm striving to have a structure that i can understand and has those elements to it so that um how do i put it it's like a skeleton so that as you work you're working uh, within constraints that make sense for the project and have design ideas behind them. Like why I'm choosing to use this instrument over that instrument can be that I don't want it to clash because I know I'm going to be using, you know, some other instrument that's in the same range as that one. Um, but usually it's also kind of uh, 
built around some concept of like, oh, well, but I'm also using that instrument because it represents this idea for this character or this location or this uh, form of game data that I'm trying to communicate. And so it's kind of a, it's a multi-tiered um, uh, structure that I usually try and come up with that's serving the function of guiding my compositions, but also really ideally serving the product as a whole, you know, both aesthetically speaking, like as a, you know, like a brand, right? A, you know, Team Fortress, it's, you know, like there's some obvious things happening there that support the idea of, of Team Fortress sort of 1960s, you know, mercenary team uh, vibe. Uh, but also at the same time, um, you know, Team Fortress isn't a good example because there's not a lot of in-game music, but, you know, let's say Left 4 Dead or something, there's a huge structure there that really is um, designed to serve the game in a, on a whole bunch of different levels and at the same time structured so that musically speaking it's not clashing um, from an information uh, information theory standpoint which is kind of what you're talking about I, I I know I'm kind of talking in circles a little bit but no I do <laughs> no, no no it's it's good it's good it's good uh, I but... do think there's real similarities like I think of one of the very first shots I did on um Lord of the Rings uh we were I was working in the massive department you know we were doing these big crowd simulations you know so you've got let's say 100 uh orcs or whatever doing some scene and um I set it up so that, you know, like with traditional sort of um, design concepts in mind so that your eye is guided by this one character who runs out and then there's like a little scene where that character is and then everyone else is doing, you know, there's, I think the goal is to get maybe 300 people, you know, characters out there doing stuff and they're all doing their, their, um, their AI based animation. And everyone was just really, really impressed with how well the scene worked because it was the first one that had really sold this idea of a crowd. And really all it was is just traditional design. You know, it was like I was guiding your eyes so that you were really focused on this action that was happening that was also AI, but, you know, then everything else was was noise or whatever, you know, kind of crowd, crowd animation. And so... It's the exact same kind of thing that you do with uh, a lot of composing, not not always, but similar things that you you kind of have to think of um, what what the overall experience is and how are you fitting into it. And you know, with video games, I spend a lot a lot of time thinking about um, how is is you, are you mentally engaged, you know, mm. um, and physically too. Like, are you using controllers or a mouse and keyboard? And so you've got this physical interaction as well as mental engagement. And if I'm just pushing way too much musical information at the same time, you're trying to figure something out, you know, that there's a clash there too. It's not just, you know, a, you know, a trumpet with a, you know, another instrument that might clash. It's yeah. like if that trumpet's really active and you're trying to figure something out, it might, you might end up with a player who's like, you know, Oh my God, make that trumpet stop because I can't think, you know. Well, wasn't that what you had to, or that that was part of the challenge in Half-Life Alex? You had to pull back a bit? Like yeah. the developers wanted more silence in parts or more ambient pieces where the music's not as much in your face? Well, it was really interesting. That one at first, you know, that was probably three plus year project I was on. And at first... You know, we we're developing the index alongside of it. We had the Vive, right? Um, and so uh, we could, uh, you know, do tests and stuff. Um, but I was sort of testing, and this is a problem with a lot of games in general, is if you're, I like to be involved really early on because it gives you more time to work on stuff and sort of uh, come up with different ideas and explore, explore things. Um, but sometimes you can be exploring too early and so I was trying some things that where I hadn't had a chance to establish that music was being used like a film. And so there'd suddenly be music and people would be like, whoa, whoa, like, you know, that's, that's not right. Like, where's the music coming from? You know, it's VR or whatever, like, um, and so, uh, so I really did back off for a long time. And I think regrettably to a degree, because I think it, it, I, I didn't have as much time to do work on some of the things I would have liked to, but um, 
what I later figured out is that I was going to really need, like, I was going to need to use some music like film, you know, to kind of say, hey, this is a big adventure. This is a epic experience, right? Which is sort of what film music often does. Mm. Um, and so I had moved into a more ambient space. And there's a lot of stuff in there that is, you know, really crosses the line between diegetic and non-diegetic. Like the music's actually literally coming from some machine or, or something like that. Um, but so what I ended up doing is really early in the film, I just went ahead and just did some music that was um, really very classically cinema sounding, you know? So it was like, oh, right, there's a film score happening right now. And what it did is it kind of set the stage. So then when I did it later on, um, people wouldn't be surprised or feel weird about it in VR. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, it does make sense. But from from a challenging aspect, was that like the hardest soundtrack to work on? I mean, I mean it's a massive soundtrack and because you're incorporating VR, um you yeah. you're entering new territory pretty much. It was it was you know, other than, you know, the the normal challenges of like when I very first started at Valve, there was, you know, a lot of challenges there just cuz I'd never worked at a game company before. Um, and technically speaking, there was just a lot to be done. Mm. But yeah, this the, Alex was by far the most challenging um, for just a lot, a ton of different reasons. VR was one, um, you know, it's Half-Life. So there's just a ton of pressure. Um, and, you know, and Kelly Bailey had done all the music to previous yeah, Half-Lives. That's right. And, um, and so, you know, and, and I, like I said, I like to have a structure. I like to have sort of a Bible and, you know, a design Bible before I go into something. And so, you know, I had to, I studied his music just inside and out and, you know, kind of came up with, you know, my own design that, you know, cause it's also not Gordon, it's Alex. And it's in a time period that's in between, you know, uh, the, you know, Half-Life one and two. And so um, I sort of, you know, designed it as if it were Kelly working in that, you know, like in right. 2002 yeah. or three, you know, somewhere in there. Um, and, you know, and then I had to kind of make it my own to, to a degree, just to, just to get it done, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so you mentioned that you like, like structure. How did you find it adapting to Valve's philosophy then? Because it doesn't have a hierarchical structure, does it? <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. <laughs> so, was it was it easy to adapt to that sort of um, way of working, or did it take you a while? It definitely took me a while. I think it was probably harder for me than some people. Some people really take to it easily, um, I, and I, it's ironic because I come from a really um, punk rock background, you mm. know, really anti-authoritarian sort of, <laughs> you know, no, no bosses or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I, I, it took me a while to realize. Um, that in that space where, you know, when you have a boss, you have somebody to complain about or somebody to blame, you know, to blame, right? <laughs> and when there's nobody above you, it really is a, a, a different sense. You kind of have to, it's a real adjustment because you really, there's no one but you, you know, and and eventually you learn it's your colleagues and, the, you know, it's it's putting a lot of trust in the people that are around you and and realizing more importantly that they trust you you know or gaining that trust and so um yeah it's that part was a big adjustment i had just come from working on giant films which yeah. are about as hierarchical as it gets you know um and uh and also there's uh there was definitely a lot of learning around um you know i'm a, a musician right and an experimental one you know uh at that. Um, and so, like I said, there's a lot of, um, a lot of my investment as an artist has been in culturing emotions and really being able to, it's like an acting, you know, like I said earlier, it's sort of mm. like, you know, you, you really are taking an emotion, amplifying it and overselling it through your guitar or your piano playing or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, you know, I got to Valve and for Valve to function the way it does, everyone has to have a certain level of object, objectivity and sort of 
you know, making good decisions and making right, not, not impulse driven, you know, God, I'm pissed off, you know, like those are not the kinds of decisions you want to be making at a place like that. You want to be objectively thinking things through. And, um, and so it did take me a while to adjust just even my inner personality to, um, to not function more on an impulse level, which is kind of more the art side of things typically speaking and and find out finding a way to meld those two things together um and so i so in that way it's interesting i I, yeah i mean you're the way you pose the question is like the valve doesn't have structure um but hierarchical structure but it obviously there's some sort of structure there otherwise nothing would come out ever right (laughs) And, and the truth is is there is sort of a hierarchical structure of sorts it's just not explicit it's implicit and it's ever changing you know what i mean um every project you work on you kind of figure out where you sit and who you trust and and also like who on this project needs to be given responsibility or given power Right. Because, Mm. you know, it's there's always going to be someone who's going to lead or that is going to manage all the the bug triage or or whatever. And as long as you're watching and paying attention, um, you can grant them that power over you, you know. And if other people see you doing that, then as a group, you kind of we all sort of end up agreeing, hey, we're going to let this person, you know, let is not quite the right word, but we're going to you know, observe their necessity for having a certain amount of power, right? Mm. Um, yeah, and, that makes sense. Yeah, and it's, it's. I mean, it's, people act like it's a really, and I know when I got there, I was just like, now I remember having dinner with Gabe and going, this is just bullshit. Now, come on, like, tell me, how does this <laughs> actually work, you know? Um, but, uh, but it really does, but it, it's also, you got to learn how to function in that space and, and, you know, and realize we're all human and you know. yeah but like yeah. some composers right they find it difficult if they don't have a deadline right so they need <laughs> to be pushed sometimes in order to finish something otherwise they can get too many ideas and they end up going all over the place both both um mentally and musically um so did did you have that problem or were you able to just almost develop tunnel vision and just focus on the the task at hand, regardless of if there was some sort of deadline, no one yeah. like creeping over your shoulder, so to speak. So. I, no, I, I, it, I think I fall somewhere sort of in the middle. I, I saw your uh, conversation with Eric, you know, um, and I definitely can fall into that role of I'm going to put it off until like I have to get it done. Uh, but usually, if I'm doing that, it's because I don't have a full understanding of what it is I'm trying to accomplish. Mm. Um, you know, I can, I can just make music. Um, but that that's where the structure part comes in. Right. Is that, uh, it's sort of, I don't I, I'm a big, I, I'm a big fan of, um, film theory and Eisensteinian theory and films are the worst, the worst case, right? Because you've got this hour and a half long story you have to tell. And if you're, let's say a director out shooting, and you're just willy nilly shooting actors acting this way and that way, um, it won't tie together as a whole, right? It, the, and that's why a lot of films fail. Um, and Eisenstein was the first guy to sort of identify this idea that you need an overall principle. I mean, he was Russian, so of course it's, you know, very um, <laughs> ideolog- ideologically based. Um, but the idea is that, you know, you have this overall principle that you're trying to communicate and therefore every time you're shooting or you're working on something, you're keeping that in mind. And that's where my structures kind of come from is just trying to build up so that when I do work on a piece of music, I know what the goal is for it. Um, and, and therefore I can tell if I'm succeeding or not, because really at the end of the day, like you know, I'm a workaholic. I love to work. Like, that's just, I'm not a anti, like, I understand problems and crunches and especially getting old. Like I, I have to be careful for my health, but like, I love the work of it. Right. And, mm. um, and we can talk about that more if you want, but, um, but the problem is, is in, so I, I'm happy to work on something forever, but if I don't know what the goal is or what I'm trying to achieve with it or have some sort of deeper structure that I'm trying to satisfy, 
then it is sort of like you're just working and like uh you know and which you know i'm i know i kind of i tend to talk in circles but um you know it's it's also why i like to get in on a project early but often the project doesn't really solidify till later too so it's kind of this mixed bag of you can get in early and try stuff but it's often later in the project when the real um design of it and requirements and whatnot become clear yeah. and that's you know that's that's when i really dig in um you know i i've heard other composers talk about like when they start especially film because film is a more con usually it's like a three or four month period right and well it's it's yeah. usually quite intense for a small block as opposed to games which is stretched over a longer period right so yeah yeah exactly and a lot of them will talk about the same thing where the first month or whatever they're just messing around and sleeping a lot you know mm. um and then and so what you know in my mind what that is is like kind of collecting up all the ideas I, like during the early phases i'll you know i'll sit at the piano a ton and just kind of mess around but trying to find sort of again like maybe a musical structure some themes some you know some uh, harmonic motions that feel like the right um, structure to work from going forward and i'll kind of collect up a you know in my mind i'll write them down and then when the time comes like when it is like go time you because know, like you said a game you know you can be going hard for a year easily mm. um, um but when that time comes then i'll have like a collection of ideas and bigger like themes, like more like narrative themes or, you know, musical themes too, but um, not just like, you know, uh, the theme for the game. I mean, like kind of bigger structures that, that you're, you know, like, oh, I, I want to, you know, like with Alex, you know, at the beginning, the music's fairly cinema and standard and it's, the reason is is because over the course of the the game she like slowly but surely gets into weirder and weirder places and more extreme horror and and alien um experiences and you, you know she's also this young woman who's kind of been in a you know admittedly a tough existence but the way we structured it was like oh they were you know kind of doing heists and stuff you know they're fighting in the resistance you know um but then she goes off and it this you know the whole story from there is gets darker and darker and darker and her role in it gets deeper and deeper and heavier and heavier and so by the end you know you're in the vault where all of reality is upside down you know um and so you know once i could wrap my head around that and the sorts of things i'm going to do to facilitate that then then okay i'm going to work on this music over here i know it should be fairly standard and if it's in the middle somewhere it should be kind of halfway between crazy out here you know what i mean and um yeah makes sense when you were in wellington and you're working on lord of the rings did you i mean were you still interested in what the film score was going to be like like I mean, obviously, Wellington's very self-contained, right? And yeah. it's probably a lot easier to network with different people. So if, like, when Howard Shaw would have been there for a period of time, were you able to I, meet with him? I was I was not, um, you know, I was, I was high up enough that, like, I spent a lot of time with Peter Jackson. And, like, I definitely had access to those people if I want, uh, wanted. And, and I, like I said, I directed, you know, all of the Fellowship characters. So... Um, I would see them and we would talk and, and whatnot, but um, I wasn't really, it's interesting. I wasn't aware at that time that this is what I wanted to do. Ah, like, okay. Yeah. Truthfully. I mean, I've played music since I was, you know, a young teenager and very seriously, like I studied and, um, and have spent pretty much my whole life up until sort of the late 90s or mid 90s um, in studios, right? Um, so I did go visit, they had a, a production, you know, studio there and I went and visited that. So I was checking out their, you know, their recording rooms and mixing consoles and sound designers. And I met those guys. Um, and so that was interesting, but I was um, very uh, clearly, for me, in my mind, I was, 
pursuing a different path during that period. Um, I had a studio at home in Breaker Bay, you know, that I, I, I made lots of, I always am recording music. Like I have never not done that. Um, so I made a bunch of tapes of various things that, you know, of varying degrees of interesting or not interesting. Um, but um, I was, I was not planning on coming back to music necessarily. Um, so how fact, did that, I, how did that happen? Like, how did you come back to music? If, if you weren't even on that path, I mean, it's, you know, it's such a great story, I feel. You know, it's a funny one. I, like I said, I always played, but uh, during that period, I was kind of really moving away from my, you know, experimental noise background a bit. And so I was playing a lot of, actually that guitar right there is this teeny Mexican nylon string classical guitar. Um, and so I was playing a lot, but I just, nothing was really striking me as interesting to do. And I was really into the film thing, you know, I was really into working on big films and doing animation and um, sort of the impact of that. And when I moved back to the Bay Area um, and was working on the Matrix films, I have a friend who um, had, we had been in a band together before and was, was doing, it was a producer, like he's a real good studio engineer. Um, and he had started doing music to, for soundtracks and had invited me into a studio to play some guitar. And I, I played like sitar and guitar for him. Um, and just didn't, I didn't really think much about it. Like it was fun because, you know, I love going to the studio, but it wasn't, just didn't really, I, you know, I was working all the time. So I wasn't really thinking about it. And then I went to see some film. It might have even been. No, it wouldn't have been one of the Lord of the Rings films. But anyway, I went to see some film at the local theater. And, um, you know, the screen went black and this, like, guitar just came out so loud. Like, and I was like, God, I really, that is so familiar. And then this trailer came up and it was the film that my friend had worked on. And it was my guitar, right? And it was just like blasting in this theater i mean it was you know a proper size a real theater and a real trailer yeah. and i was just like holy shit that's me <laughs> like that's me you know and all of a sudden like all the the you know the the gears clicked into place i was like yeah. oh wait I, maybe i wanted that's what i should be doing um and then it was kind of a slow process from there um into you know, getting back into it. Cause I, you know, I had, like I said, I had spent 10 years not really focusing on, you know, all the technology and, and, and whatnot that goes into, to producing music yeah. of that sort. Um, and had never really written, you know, I'd done sort of some half-assed writing for orchestra in the past, but not like I hadn't really sat down and thought about it and, um, and exercised through all the different, things you need to to know to do it um and uh and so right and then right around that same time my friend bay rate who designed Gollum's face on lord of the rings had signed on at valve and was working on the sfm uh, and we and we go way back like uh we worked at this animation studio together in the mid 90s um, which was kind of one of the first stepping stones to me to going to film. In fact, he was the one that brought me to New Zealand. He was like, ah, dude, you got to come down here. This is amazing. Like, you got this, this whole scene is crazy. Um, but he kind of did the same thing at Valve, but he was trying to hire me to do animation and, and that sort of thing. And I was just like, nah, I'm, I'm good here. If I'm going to do animation, I kind of want to stay in film. Um, but Valve was really interesting to me. Um, and for a whole bunch of reasons. And I was like, but if you guys, you know, I'm thinking about scoring and doing, um, you know, it's, you know, scores for um, film, I'd be interested in that. And so he talked to Kelly and Kelly's like, no, nah, I, you know, if, if we're going to hire somebody, I'd rather hire a programmer to take over my programming chops. And, and I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do that really. Um, and so we kind of, stopped talking about it, but I kept doing some side work for Valve that was animation centric, some uh, technical stuff and whatnot. Um, and then kept scoring for small films and, and stuff like that. Anyway, so long story short, 
you know, nine months later or something, Bay and I are talking and I say, oh yeah, I'm going to this film that my music is in. And he's like, wait, you're still doing that. I was like, yeah. And he said, well, you know, I think Kelly's too busy to finish this current set of games we have. And so let me check and see. And that was kind of early days, you know, like on the orange box. And uh, it just so happened that Kelly's like, yeah, let's bring him up. And I went up and kind of spent two weeks there, which is an unusual, usually the process is, uh, you know, the, the interview process is pretty intensive, but this was like two weeks of me actually just seeing what it was like for them to see what it was like to have me there um, and whether it was valuable from a game development standpoint and film development standpoint, because we were doing the SFM stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and I think it came back uh, super clear that it was valuable to have a composer in the room. Um, and then I then I went through the the uh, gauntlet of a Valve interview, um, which what, was super. What, when you say the gauntlet of Valve interviews, well, like, what do you mean? Like, do you have to have multiple interviews, like five interviews, or is it like really like an interrogation, or what, what are we talking? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, having I now that I'm on the other, you know, it's I've been there almost twenty years, so. Um, Try, I'll try to present it from the the user's perspective is, yeah, it's like a day of interviews um, with different people from different domains, right? Um, who interview you on different t topics or sort of domains that one would hope that you would be able to communicate about um, and understand. Um, and so, uh, you know, in an ideal situation, you're there for three or four interviews and then you're just offered a job right away. You know, the standard one is like, you're there all day long. It's five interviews um, of, of different sort of topics and different, it's usually two or three people who are talking to you about whatever the topic uh, that your domain sort of lends you you know it's 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 hard like i did one yeah. on writing writing for games for example right right okay. um and so you know uh because i'm a composer you would hope that i could communicate about writing some story for game and so we worked through this this uh, example uh, test case where i was writing for this scenario um and it was interesting because i was writing as if it were a film Right. Like the story I came up with was solving all the problems of a film. And at the end, you know, the, the it, it was usually we don't do this. But at the end, um, the one of the people who was interviewing me went, actually, like, this is how I would do it. Right. Because ah, it's actually, you know, here's how I would write it, because we're trying to get you to do these, you know, uh, game mechanics and, and work what, your way through it. So um, it it's sort of it's sort of that. But. Yeah, so it's exhausting, and it's yeah. You know, it sounds like it. Like, I, how do you stay alert for that long? If it's like a whole yeah. day of interviews, like it's, you yeah. have to stay alert, and you don't want to say something stupid, either. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, yeah, it's uh, like again, I don't want to go into it too much. No, no, but well, hey, it worked out because obviously yeah. you're there, so <laughs> you did everything <laughs> um, right. And, you know, at the end of the day, too, I think uh, I genuinely think having been on the other side of many, many of those interviews, the real goal is to um, just discern it's it's not it's it's weird. I know this is going to sound almost trite or something, but the goal is to to not hire somebody that doesn't that is not going to be happy there. And is you know if you're yeah. not going to function in that environment very well, if you're not going to be able to communicate about the things you're working on, or maybe something someone else is working on, right? Because that's the other thing is there's no producers or um, uh, people to tell people what to work on. So if you need to recruit, some, you you have an idea. Let's say, for example, I'm like, oh, the the big energy conveyor to the to the vault should be multiple strings that are humming at frequencies that makes this music right mm -hmm. and and i you know i've been there long enough i'm like oh i'm gonna go talk to tristan because tristan you know we've done similar things in the past and he'll kind of and he was already designing it anyway and so you know but he'll say like oh okay well that's great but here's how I'm doing the, you know, I'm animating the textures, you know, I'm using, I'm animating the UV coordinates for the textures, you know, and, and so, and the timer, I don't know what the timer is for animating the UV coordinates. And so I'm like, 
okay, I got to figure out what time base we're working in so that I can sync the audio up with his anime, you know what I mean? And so, yeah. you know, when you're, when you're recruiting people on a direct level like that, you, you, you don't have to be able to speak their language, but it really helps, you know? And so that's a lot of, that's a lot of what, what happens um, when, you know, when Valve is, is interviewing people for jobs. Not always, every job is different. I don't know what like a, a you know, an art interview loop looks like, or, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, like, um, but at the end of the day, you know, I got through the loop, so. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you're in a good space, so it's, it's yeah. good. So, and then spend a couple of years like going, oh, what is this place? <laughs> <laughs> so what's the dynamic like, say, obviously with someone like Gabe, as opposed to someone like Peter Jackson? Because obviously you have interactions with, or had interactions with both of them. Because mm -hmm. they, um, they, they seem like completely different individuals. Just yes. from various interviews. And I mean, obviously I don't know either one of them, but. Um, I mean, you know, you know, uh, Peter Jackson and the Wachowskis are also really different people. Um, yeah. You know, everyone's different, but they're all very powerful, which is, um, I think, is is a notable thing that and it, that's impossible to ignore, really. Um, but you kind of, I don't know, I, you know, I've also met a lot of really super famous celebrities and you, it's just easier if you just kind of cut past it and go to the work, you know? Um, and, and then your personalities will either jive or they won't or whatever. Like, that's just a humans, like, that's just how we are. But if we've got the work in common, then there's sort of an allyship that can happen that really helps you cut through, um, the, the, you know, the sort of surface social stuff that can get in the way. Um, yeah. you know, the, the Wachowskis and Peter Jackson are of the film world. So there is a, a cultural like uh, similarity there, right? Um, and film is intrinsically a uh, hierarchical and social beast, right? You know, you've got actors that you need to um, convince in one way or another to do the performance that you're hoping for, or even just for them to want to do the job as well as you want them to do it, right? Um, Whereas games are a much more isolated, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of work at the computer, a lot of programmery stuff. So there, that the culture of game studios is going to be different just by design um, and by, by nature, I think, um, than film. Um, and, you know, Gabe definitely uh, comes from that world. He's a, he's a programmer and a good one. Um, and he is, uh, I think probably the biggest overt difference um, that I would, and you know, I mean, I don't know what the Wachowskis think about or don't think about or Peter Jackson for that matter, but Gabe is definitely thinking big picture. Like he is, he is the quintessential visionary, you know, at Valve. Um, not that he's like turning the wheel and steering the ship and saying, Hey, everybody, let's go. But you know, I'll, I remember going to lunch with him, wanting to talk about something fairly, you know, specific. Like I, I forget. Like we just want to. I, something I needed to do. So that's going to be fairly constrained. And like, <laughs> I you know, over the next week, to I kind of want to. Yeah, I yeah. kind of <laughs> need to sit down and do this work. And I'm just wondering what you think about it. And all of a sudden, we're talking about using, you know. Uh, uh, financial economic systems to guide the experiential gameplay in a multiplayer something something you know it was probably early dota days so it was probably something along those lines and you know it was like uh, okay like i like i'm i'm like just keeping up like i can usually keep up with um what he has to say um but at the same time it's like okay you're like you're looking really you know, further down the road and, and thinking about some big picture stuff that I, like, I still just need to actually execute this thing this week. And, you know, so um, I really, I'm a huge fan though. I, uh, even after the interview loop and everything, um, I was not sure I wanted to, 
go work at Valve, to be totally honest. Um, I wasn't sure I wanted to move. Um, and uh, and I, it was a brief conversation with him that I had after the loop that, you know, it was a still, it was a much smaller company back then, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 people. Something. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know, and so, of course, <clears throat> you would go sit with Gabe after an interview loop. Um, and uh, And he said something along the lines of, you know, we just do the best work we can to make our customers happy, our players. He didn't even call them. He would never call them customers. He would say like, you know, our users are our players. And, and if we do that, cause I was probably asking him like, how are we, you know, making films here? Cause that's what we were doing at the time is SFM work. That mm. was sort of the t team I was joining up with initially. Um, you know, and he, he basically was like, you know, the money will work itself out. If we're making people happy, like the money will work itself out. And, uh, and he, you know, what it didn't sound like a platitude, you know? Um, mm. And then on top of that, like he, uh, I think he's probably the single largest advocate and reason the company has managed to stay a flat structure all these years and, and successfully so, um, which is really, I think, an important thing to keep in mind because he's the one ostensibly with the most power right yeah and in any in any other traditional company he would be right um and so uh i just have ultimate respect for that for sure i'm hoping there's something you can maybe nip in the bud here because i think this is something that kind of got taken out of context and got blown up on the internet so obviously during the pandemic or the height of the pandemic he was in New Zealand, stranded in New Zealand. Well, I don't know if you want to use stranded as the word because it looked like he was having the time of his life. But um, he mentioned to the New Zealand media that they were considering putting a Valve office in New Zealand, like maybe setting one up, right? And if if uh, the trajectory of the pandemic was that um, we were going to be in lockdown for like years and years on end, but do you remember internally if that was actually ever a thing? Because it sounds like it was something that was maybe just, it was something that was just put out there maybe just to feel it out, but nothing concrete was ever uh, set in stone because it, it, it seems like it blew up on the internet and became this large thing. Um, and I was thinking, hmm, I'm not sure that's quite what he meant. Yeah, I um I definitely remember it because we're all like getting on Zoom and you know hanging out <laughs> yeah. and, and and having meetings and and a lot of those meetings were just you know us bullshitting because you know um it was the pandemic and we just shipped Alex too so we were kind yeah. of in a a mellow phase anyway um so you know and and often too because again without you know a, a direct clear hierarchy we often learn about stuff in the news just like everybody else um. And that we all were like, whoa, okay. Um, it wouldn't, all I know is, is I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't sitting in meetings with the people would, who would be having those conversations. I could have, you know, again, it's Valve. Anybody could sit in those meetings if they really wanted to. Yeah. But um, I just like often don't see much value to it for me or from me, either direction. Um, and particularly in that case, you know, um, I was, you know, just watching Netflix like everybody else. Um, but I, I do think that, it, you know, he was probably quite serious. I do recall, you know, I went and Googled and checked all the little interviews I could find on the topic. And I do recall him saying like, it, like the idea wasn't necessarily to move Valve to New Zealand. It was more like to have a place where maybe hiring some Kiwis could happen. You know, I, that's what I recall it kind of being a little bit more like, but I really don't know. It wouldn't be the first time it has, the topic has come up uh, in the past, not necessarily New Zealand, but Hawaii has come up, you know, oh. somewhere that doesn't rain nine months, nine months out of the year. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I don't like, yeah, again, I, I, I'm sorry, I wish I could dispel or... No, no, or no. I, I, hey, I, I just think it was something that was blown way out of proportion. And I think people <laughs> yeah. were getting their hopes up. And I was thinking, um, I think it's a little too early to... And like, I, look, I just know how the internet works. I mean, you just said, right? You often read stuff in the news and you're like, huh, okay. 
you know, someone yeah. someone from Valve speaks about something and it blows up into this big thing and yeah, I, I you know, people didn't even know about. So yeah, I I mean, I personally have to be really careful just because people are always looking for some little tidbit of something. Of course, and, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and can you imagine if you're Gabe? Like that would be a you know, he just really because he's you know he's a again he's one of the smartest people I've ever met, and I've met some really smart people in my day. Um, and, but he's also a human and can, he has, you know, moments where he can say things off the cuff too, just like anybody. I don't know. I'm not saying that's what that was, but you know, if he does, man, you know, he's going to hear about it in the news for a while. Right. If yeah. Says, particularly in this day and age with journalism is as soon as a journalist hears, they'll probably, aha. I can turn this into an article or something, you know, like a, a right. five second snippet and make, you know, this huge page article out of it. So yeah, I, I, I can understand how someone can say something and it can be misconstrued, you know, or taken out of context or blown up into something that it not necessarily is. So that's, that's why I wanted to ask. Cause I'm like, hmm, I'm pretty sure that was not the case, but I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't sure if you'd know, but I yeah, I was I was not you know I was not doing zooms with Gabe at the time and and uh, f you know f as far as I understand he's he's back in at, at HQ so um, yeah he's back in Seattle right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. though he's, he's got back. residency now in New Zealand lucky for him yeah. good for him I know yeah. yeah yeah I wish I wish I'd gotten it while I was there so oh you didn't get it you did you want to get it or just yeah, uh, no, I, I, you know, we, uh, we left, we, we had planned to stay longer, but uh, my wife got pregnant and we decided to leave instead of stay and get citizenship for our daughter. But that's, you know, that's a long story. We just yeah, needed, yeah. we smart, I think we smartly moved to be near family. Fair enough. First. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, New Zealand's quite isolated. Did you manage to attend the premiere in Wellington? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, it was yeah. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it looked, um, it looked like um, looked like total madness. Like the whole city was, the whole city had turned out. <laughs> yeah, it was great with the big orc or the 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 uh, troll at the front of the theater, and yeah, the whole thing was totally madness. It was great, and I went to the rap party. I still have all my. Every now and again, I go through boxes, and it's like, oh, is my invitation to the rap party, my invitation to the premiere, the, you know, um, all kinds of fun stuff that that came from that. Yeah. So were you still in Wellington when um, Return of the King won like 11 Oscars? No, I had left. We left right. sort of in during the production of the second film. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because so you're, worked... you're listed as working on The Two Towers and Return of the King, but was it Fellowship and The Two Towers? I Well, I did pre-production for all three. Like oh, I did a ton right. okay. of pre-production, yeah. Like, because that's the thing is, I the whole first, I want to say the whole first year I was there, all we were doing is pre-production. Like, um, you know, because they were out shooting all three films, right? And um, and they hadn't started production on or post-production on the first film yet, and so somewhere about you know nine ten months in then we finally were actually making the first film um which wrapped pretty fast you know it, mm. it post post-production happened shockingly quick um and then immediately we were just working on the second film you know did did um, you understand the gravity of what you were working on at the time <laughs> um i you know no i mean you you could imagine i guess you know i mean you know, if you look at, I mean, I was a fan of Peter Jackson's work previous to that, but it wasn't of anywhere near the scope that this turned into. Um, although we did, I, I do remember, you know, it's just like any project. There's, you know, that you, you talk, I'm sorry, I'm going to cycle back, but, you know, the whole thing of like uh, putting work off until the last second and whatnot. Yeah. Like, I, I understand that, but what that really comes down to is every project i don't care what it is at some point you have to kind of go oh this is a huge project and the fear of failure has to hit like oh, oh it doesn't have to but it always does like there's some point where i'll like even on alex you know almost 20 years into working at valve 
you know, suddenly I'm like, oh shit, this is going to be really big. <laughs> I really <laughs> need to do like, I need to make sure I don't fail, you know? Yeah. And, um, there was a con preview that we put together, um, for the fellowship. And I remember going, we did, there were two screenings one day just cause there's the crew was so big that we had to kind of go in, t in two groups and we kind of viewed it, you know, some weeks before the con preview was going to happen. Um, and man, we came out and everyone was just like total hang dog, like, Oh no. Right. But then the, those following two or three weeks, like, at, no one was sleeping. Everyone was, you know, just um, do, working their hardest to make sure that it didn't fail at con. And then it didn't, you know, it was, it was a huge splash. I think it was maybe a full half hour or something. It was a, quite a big preview, you know, might've been 15 minutes, but it was, it was long as I recall. Yeah. So do you ever have, or still have, or ever had, but imposter syndrome where you're like, what am I doing? Or has, has that never happened? Like you always, like, no, nah, I can do this. I'm up to this task. I no, I always have it like always. Um, you know, I imposter at this point, like you got to kind of go, OK, like, you you know, if you're if you've had certain amount of successes, you have to sort of admit that the odds are pretty good. You're not going to fail, you know? Yeah. Um, that Or that you're not an imposter. But I mean, the, here's the thing, like every field has a michael jordan right like i think that all of us have certain innate abilities like probably our dna gives us some little advantage like like my hands aren't very big like mm. um my piano playing would be so much be better if i had another inch on every finger you know like seriously like i would be a much much better guitar player so on and so forth there's those things but we all kind of then trade off like the things we focus on we choose to focus on we don't focus on you know, but usually you're you're taking from one area to feed the other, right? Like if you're really good at one thing, you know, but then there's the Michael Jordan characters who are like, they, they jump, they run, they, you know, they got big hands, you know, like they, they can do everything. And they kind of set the bar for not imposter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. And then the rest of us are always kind of like, oh, but you know, I only do this part but, you know, um, so I, you know, yeah, I do suffer from it. I, I suffer more from, um, just this, like I said, this knowledge that failure is the default, right? Like that you don't, it's not, you can't just like kick back and it's all going to succeed and be amazing. Right. Like you got to work. It's a, it's if you're going to work at any at level that's sort of near like Lord of the Rings or, you know, half-life games or whatever, you got to work really hard, you mm. know? And, and, and then there's always this fear of like, Oh, what if you're making bad choices and whatnot? But, um, but that's oh, wow. where, that's where valves kind of theory and plan works pretty well because hopefully you've learned by working with your colleagues, how to make good, the best choices possible given, you know, the, the amount of information and the sort of prioritization that is being made. And um, so, yeah, I definitely suffer from it. Um, but I also just, um, I, I definitely use work to not think about it. Yeah. You know, makes just sense. Dig in and work really hard and, and, and then, you know, sort of go, well, you know, hopefully I didn't make too many bad choices. Wow, I think you've made some pretty good choices given your career. Just saying. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be pretty I, I happy wish, with it. I'd be pretty happy that, with it. I wish it did, you know. I mean, make the not fear, many people can say they composed for Portal 2 and also did visual effects on like what's considered, you know, possibly the greatest film trilogy of all time. So, hey, <laughs> I'd, I'd take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's so funny I, I rarely think about it that way but thank you that that uh makes me feel like less of an imposter briefly <laughs> okay well if i can help in any way i suppose that's that's good um because one of the good things um and I'll, I'll probably wrap up here but like you have been able to create so many different sound palettes right 
So, or, or musical palettes. Like Team Fortress 2, the music sounds very different from Left 4 Dead, which sounds very different from Portal 2 and even Half-Life Alex. So it's a very challenging every time because you're almost creating a new musical palette. And I suppose the longer you do it in your career, the harder it gets because you've got less room to <laughs> find a new sound or a new musical sound or, of some sort. Yeah. No, that's a that's a, actually a really great observation. Um, it uh, for whatever reason, I decided really early on that like genre and and like sound palette or however you want to describe it, it was part of my palette. You know, it's part of my the the tools that I can use, um, and so it does sort of end up presenting a challenge in from a design standpoint but i also really view it from a design standpoint um you know i i go after these things kind of going you know what everything from you know the story of course like the the big arc of the story like what's the the cell like what's alex going to experience what who is she at the beginning who is she at the end all that stuff but i'm also looking at it from a brand standpoint another valve kind of thing is that of course i I'm good friends with the person who's probably going to, at the end of the day, being like, oh, here's how we present it to the public. Here's the types of ads we're going to do or not do or how, you know what I mean? Or, you know, what the, the artwork's going to look like. And so I'm always thinking about that stuff, too, along the way. And so I'm trying to satisfy all of the above at once. Um, and it would be way easier if I were just like, you know, I'm just, I just use orchestra and, you know, I just do, I don't know, romantic mid-century <laughs> stuff or whatever, you know, like it would be way, 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 way easier on me. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I, I don't know. I think I definitely have a certain amount of um, like, I don't it, I don't want to misappropriate a word, but like a, a certain amount of OCD or a certain amount of sort of I need to satisfy a, s a certain number of check boxes when I'm working on something. And I think the design side of it is a huge, st will always be a huge one for me, um, mm -hmm. making sure that I can say this entire piece um, of music for the whole thing matches the product in a way that is satisfying i i mean i don't want to this is like i can veer off into a whole nother topic but i have a certain amount of synesthesia which is i and i've since since kind of realizing this um i i now realize there are other composers who have a this similar form of synesthesia which is when i hear music i kind of see in my mind not like necessarily in my eyes this really difficult to describe um, kind of 3D abstract sculpture. Um, and it kind of has some color to it, but it has a, it has like a feeling to it, a very distinct feeling. Um, and, and so often when I'm composing, uh, I will see or work on some visual or, you know, play some gameplay and I'll immediately know what I, I need, what piece, what the music is for that but I know it in this weird 3D thing in my brain that I can't, that I then have to write the music to satisfy that thing, right? And it's, right. A, it's a really weird thing, but I have heard other um, professional composers talk about that. Um, again, it'd probably be a lot easier on me if I heard music and saw notes on a staff, you know? The, um, um, but I, you know, because of this thing, um music will sound wrong to like in concert with a product or in concert with gameplay if it doesn't satisfy this sort of um other representation that i have in my head that mm. i can then pair with things differently than just like hearing it i mean i hear music too and i can play it back in my head and all that but um uh, it's a uh, it's definitely i'm working to satisfy a bunch of different avenues and um and design is is a huge one for me so yeah uh you know hopefully valve has enough sequels in us that 
I can just work in the like the ones I've designed already. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, well, hey, um, we won't we won't go into sequels or anything because uh, <laughs> that can that can go down the rabbit hole. But um, the good thing about music is there's no template, so if it works for you, it works for you. And that's all that matters, right? Is, right? Yeah. Really, well, yeah. honestly, I'm almost more afraid of like doing a Team Fortress three or a you know Portal three would be fun because I, I could explore that that musical space you know for a long time i don't think i'd have any issues with just exploring that again but team fortress i have really mined that 60s feeling um quite a bit the you know the 60s meets uh, italian cinema kind of thing um and so if if we we're to do it i it, i would definitely have to spend some time thinking about what a new team fortress would sound like you know hopefully it'd be set in a different era so then yeah I could, and you'd yeah. have to worry about the expectations as well to live up to the yes. hype as well, which is, That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, I'll um, wrap up there. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I very much appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. If anyone wants to keep in contact or up to date with what you're doing, is there any any way they can follow you on any social media well, they, or anything? You know, Mike Moraski at Twitter um, is that's I use Twitter almost exclusively to talk about work. And so um, you don't have to listen to me talk about politics or any other um, <laughs> personal stuff. Uh, for the most part, every now and again, I'll blab something out there. But uh, that's a good way to find out uh, anything that's that is happening publicly speaking. Um, and then there's the there's the contact. There's a the valve has a website contact thing and I am uh, and it's enabled for me so you can contact me directly through the website um and then and then eventually you'll get my email i mm. i don't have any pro i don't have any problem emailing with people um you know gabe does it if gabe can do it i can you know soldier on and yeah i um, don't know how he finds the time to do it but yeah it's it speaks, it's amazing it speaks i still to the aura of gabe doesn't it so yeah. yeah it does it's it's impressive for sure Mm. Um, and I, I don't always get back to everybody. I try, I really do try to, but, um, you know, occasionally they hit me and it scrolls off the bottom and, um, but I try pretty hard. Mm. All right. Well, um, that is the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe, support Mike and all his, his, uh, future endeavors. And I look forward to seeing more of your work as well in the future. Likewise. I enjoy your show. So. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. All right, everyone, uh, take care. Until next time, stay safe.